Hi, I'm Trevor Mueller, creator of Albert the Alien and Nexus on Webtoon, and you are watching Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We're joined today by, I believe this is going to be a sixth time on the show, something along that line. I've known him since 2010, it's that long ago, where I met Russell Lazau as well, in a line to get tickets for the press portion of what I ended up doing for video interviews. That being said, this talented individual has created Albert the Alien. He has also created a lot of other comics and young adult novels and he has a brand new comic coming out on Webtoon called Nexus. We are joined today by the ever talented Trevor Mueller. How are you doing today, Trevor? I'm doing great, buddy. Thanks so much for having me on the show. Anytime, man. It has been at least five plus years since we've last talked, something along that line. Uh, a lot has changed in your life, uh, creatively as well as family-wise. And other than this brand new project you have coming out called Nexus, how have you been? Good. Very busy. Um, <clears throat> I've been focusing, you know, five years ago, it's interesting that timeline, right? Because that's around the time my first kid was born. Uh, and so obviously that, that eats up a chunk of time. Um, I've got two now, two little ones. Um, and then, uh, you know, just the, the comic book stuff has been keeping us busy. And I mean, Albert, Albert, we worked on that book for six years, Gabe and I produced four graphic novels, got nominated for two Harvey Awards, um, over 800 pages of content uh, we made for that series. And then uh, when we when we ended that series, we ended up uh, just trying to see what other kind of projects would we want to work on. Gabe had started working on a couple of things for Oni Press with some other writers. He started working on a project with one of the executive producers of Family Guy. Nice. Um, but it's nothing like Family Guy, right? <laughs> like it's a very gritty kind of Western story and in a very different art style than what he drew Albert in. So it was a creative challenge for him. <clears throat> and so I was hunting around for other artists and, and creators to work with and decided to just kind of say, you know, let's do a spaghetti tactic here. Let's, let's throw spaghetti at the wall and see what sticks. And let's just pitch a whole bunch of people that I've never worked with a bunch of different projects and just see what they like, what they want to work on. Um, and so because of that, I started, kind of started working on about seven or eight different graphic novel projects mm -hmm. um, that have been in various stages of production for the last five years, um, most of which will be done next year. And we'll probably start to kind of parse them out either with Kickstarters or uh, with publisher pitches. Uh, and then I've also been mingling with a lot of the editors over at Webtoon, and I've been pitching them for the last several years as well, because I love the platform. I love the stories that they have on there. And I love the opportunity that the vertical scroll storytelling yeah. allows you to do because um, it's quite different from the printed page. So it's it's been a very eventful five years, uh, <laughs> even though it probably seems a little silent um, since I haven't been on the show. But, um, you know, it's, it's a lot of stuff going on in the background um, and a lot of stuff that people will finally get a chance to see um, probably a little bit this year, but certainly next year. Well, you've always had a lot of irons in the fire, so to speak, when it comes to what you've done creatively. And that's what I've always been impressed by. Not only what you've created, what we get to see publicly, but, you know, you're, to put a better term to it, you're, you're always hustling for something. And you're always doing a, a amazing at what you do. And that's, that's why I love getting you back on the show, because I know you'll be able to come up with, hey, I want to talk about this, this, and this. And especially with Webtoons specifically, because I've been reading a lot of online comics in like from Tapas and from a bunch of other amazing sites. So Korean, um, Korean creators creating amazing comics. And it's like a, a reinvigoration of, of the industry in mobile form, so to speak. And, and, and with Webtoon Originals too, right? Because <clears throat> Webtoon started off as a, as a Korean company, but mm -hmm. they have a U.S. editorial arm. And their, their originals that they're producing are here from the U.S. 
from American creators. Nice. Um, you know, my a lot of my friends are actually on the platform, which is how I, I met some of the people that I'm working with. Because uh, Katie Cook has nothing special on there. Dean Haspiel has the red hook. Tom Zoller's had a series of, of uh, one season stories that have appeared on there that he's collected into graphic novels. My buddy Justin Jordan has Urban Animal on there. Um, so there's a lot of people that are really using that platform, not just for webcomic distribution on Webtoon's Canvas platform, right? Which is their free, like anyone can upload to this. You know, it's, it's just a platform to get your comic book story out there. Right. But then their originals is kind of their publishing arm. And so that's like where they get professionals to come in. And some of those originals are, you know, people like me who have pitched them a story idea uh, and they have accepted it and, and they're moving forward with it and we get paid to do it, which is great. Uh, and then some of them, too, are just very, very popular canvas stories that they have that they then pick up and they bring over onto the originals platform. And that's how some of their most popular stories right now have actually been picked up. Like Laura Olympus started off that way. Yeah. Um, and I'm the Grim Reaper. Uh, and so <clears throat> they have just a really, really unique model that very much caters to the fans and their readership numbers are phenomenal, right? I mean, they're averaging like 55 million. I think it's, I can't remember if it's daily or weekly active readers. Amazing. right so it's it's amazing and it's a free app like you can download it and just read stuff on there for free i i signed up for an account so i'll definitely be downloading it for sure <laughs> uh, it's it's great to see reinvigoration of of the talented people that have not only been on the show but that we've run into in various circles throughout you know our, our current life here this model and the people you've been speaking with uh, other creative talents you know has it improve their creativity the fact that they now have a new format to go on is it is it just the same old or is it just finally a, this is something new this is something like when web comics first came out with that that kind of that push that surge of of amazing creators yeah you know it's it's new but it has sustainability mm -hmm. right it has a staying power on it because webtoon has been overseas a lot longer than it's been here and it's even more popular over in Southeast Asia than it is here. And it's all over the world. It's in Europe. It's, it's in Latam. It's, it's everywhere. Um, you know, you can download a copy of the app. And then some of the originals are actually localized. So they'll, they'll tap like Southeast Asia creators for some of the Southeast Asia originals. And then if it's popular enough, they'll translate it and they'll bring it over to other territories. Um, so those are those are things that they'll do to just kind of take those those universal stories, right? And it's, it's the same model that anime had back in the day, right? They're just really really interesting stories. They're really fun, um, you know, characters and and concepts and things that they have in there. And then they'll just bring them over uh, to other cultures and they they translate. They they work well. Nice. Um, Webtoon, I, I'd say, from a creative perspective, is a really unique challenge. Um, because again, I'm used to writing for the printed page. And so there's a little bit of a formula and, um, uh, and a rhythm that you get into when you're writing for print where, you know, every odd number page, the page turn is like a cliffhanger or a question or something like that. And you can't really do that on Webtoon because unlike regular web comics, where it's usually like a printed page that you just post up onto your website. Webtoon is a vertical scroll. It's a whole bunch of panels just kind of layered on top of each other. Mm. And you, just like you're going through Facebook or a social media feed, like you just keep scrolling to get down to the bottom of it. And that makes the pacing quite different and the formula quite different. So from a creative perspective, it was a unique challenge to kind of figure out how do I tell a story in this way? The other thing that's unique about it too is that they... Uh, each of their installments are called episodes, and then they have so many episodes within a season, they call it. And so each of those seasons will roughly translate to about a graphic novel's length. And so you're planning out, you know, an entire graphic novel from the get-go in intricate detail as a part of the pit pro pitch process. Um, and that was really kind of fun and interesting, too. Um, and very different. So again, just like a fun challenge to kind of to kind of um, put out there. And you know, our hope with with Nexus is that we would potentially get more than one season. Mm -hmm. uh, we pitched it as as several, 
Um, but depending on where the numbers are, right? Like we've got a plan where if the numbers to start there and it's not supported, then we can end it at the, at the end of season one. Um, you just don't get all the fun little things that we're going to plan for, you know, <laughs> seasons two and on. Um, but you do get a conclusion, right? And and Webtoon very much kind of encourages that model of let's make sure that you have flexibility in your story so that if for some reason readership drops or something like that, you can still get an ending. Whereas with other web comics that are out there and it's just individual creators out there, if they just stop making the comic, it just kind of fizzles out right. and goes away. So it's nice that they'll at least put a period at the end of their stories which you don't typically get uh, with independent creators doing web comics if they decide to kind of, you know, the numbers aren't there, it's just not worth their time. Let's talk about Nexus because this is something that you're obviously excited to tell the, ma the masses about. You're obviously um, have a great story. This is the sci-fi sci type genre that I don't think I've seen you do, at least when we've talked, it's never really, you've never had a sci-fi in your back pocket that I've seen. So tell us what Nexus is about and, and why you're so excited about this comic. Sure, yeah. No, it is it is hard sci-fi. It's a cyberpunk story, actually. Nice. Um, and forgive me because uh, my elevator pitch on this is rusty. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so, so Nexus kind of takes place in a near future uh, where everyone connects to the internet directly through an interface on the back of their, their head. So their brain automatically connects to the internet and it's called a Nexus interface. Um, and the story is about a, a hacker who sees more than she's supposed to and knows more than she's supposed to about something nefarious going on. And the bounty hunter who gets hired to bring her in is the only one that can keep her alive from all the uh, various organizations that are trying to kill her. <laughs> um, and so it's a, a bit of a cyberpunk thriller. We kind of based it on like a political thriller format. Um, and it has just a couple of elements in there that I've never really seen either in a cyberpunk story or in any kind of science fiction story um, that I've had on there. Typically when you include like hackers within a story, um, they tend to be like a gray hat hacker, right? It's somebody who's breaking into a corporation and hacking their files to reveal something nefarious, right? So they're, they're committing crimes, but they're doing it for good reasons. Um, but there are also black hat hackers, and uh, apologies if these terms aren't PC, but they're the only ones that I can find. <laughs> uh, so if anyone uh, has has actual more PC kind of terms for um, white, gray, and black hat hackers, please let me know. I would love to include that in the story. Um, but black hat hackers are the people that are committing crimes and doing it for bad reasons, right? So these are the ones that are putting ransomware on your computers or they're trying to, you know, dox you or they're trying to, uh, you know, post pictures that they've hacked off of your, your phone on you and ransom back to you. And then there's white hat hackers. And so this is the part that I haven't really seen in any other entertainment there, which is white hat hackers are people who are good guy hackers that do good guy things for good guy reasons. And so our main character, Jemmy, is a white hat hacker. She's hired by a company to help them find security flaws in their systems, to help them find bugs within any of their programming, uh, and again, she she gets put on her first assignment in there and just sees something she's not supposed to see, right? Uh, and ever ever since that happens, you know, she's being hunted by corrupt cops. She's being hunted by these uh, rival hackers that want to get the information that she knows. She's being hunted by this mysterious paramilitary organization, uh, and everyone's kind of out to get her. And in this world where everyone's connected to the internet crime tends to be very uh, virtual. Um, so, you know, people who are robbing you are no longer robbing you for cash. There's no really, there's not really cash in this world anymore. And so uh, all the criminals are basically just cyber terrorists, right? <laughs> like there's like hacking your bank account or they're stealing your identity and, and using it to open up fake accounts and stuff like that. And so the cops are overwhelmed. They can't, they can't, take all the cyber crime on themselves plus their jurisdiction is local if i hack somebody in another state like that's a federal crime right so we created these bounty hunters that essentially have jurisdiction everywhere over cyber crime and so as somebody breaks the law uh within the virtual space bounty hunters are brought in to kind of bring them out and so the bounty hunter in our story is named jack travis he's a former detective who due to mysterious circumstances kind of had to leave the force and became this bounty hunter and he's an analog man living in a virtual world, nice. right? Uh, and so he, he rejects technology. He doesn't have a Nexus implant. 
in his neck. He doesn't want one. He still uses a phone and everyone calls him old fashioned and retro, you know, and uh, but he's he's good with people. He understands how to find where people are. He understands how people think he knows how to, to get the answers that he needs from from situations because he's been living in such a, a physical world his entire life. And he's an older guy, right? He's probably in his late 30s, early 40s. And so as he kind of gets pulled into this web of intrigue that Jemmy has found herself in, he discovers that it ends up getting linked to some of the past, um, you know, crimes that he's had to, to help bust or, or some of the criminals that he's brought to justice back in his days when he was a detective. So everything kind of starts to link together in this web of conspiracy. Um, and it's just a really fun story to kind of, to kind of play with and a really interesting world to kind of play in. This has this been percolating in your mind for a while, or is this something that you just, you know, I've done educational, I've done young adult, you know, I need to get this story out. Yeah. Uh, again, it's, I was trying to look for something that hadn't been done before. And usually when I, when I approach an artist, I always ask them, what do you want to draw? Uh, and, and Sebastian, uh, von Bockwald is the name of my, my artist on this series. So he wanted to draw something science fiction. I was like, well, that's, there's a lot of science fiction out there, right? Do you want something that's kind of like grounded in reality? Do you want something that's kind of like cyberpunk? Do you want something that's, you know, space opera? Like, what are you looking for? And he was like, I would like a cyberpunk story or a space opera story. So I pitched him two ideas and he gravitated toward Nexus instantly because he's like, I can, I can, I can relate to these characters. I can, I can get a feel for the kind of world that you're building here. Um, and it's a very visual kind of approach to storytelling. Uh, and so from a design perspective, like he gets to have a lot of fun nice. when it comes to figuring out what do these characters look like? What do hackers look like versus bounty hunters versus cops versus these you know paramilitary people? What's the average Joe on the street look like? What do what do the rich people that work at Nexus look like? And how how do we kind of distinguish them all visually from each other? And so for him, I think it was a really fun kind of uh, design opportunity and challenge for him. And he was already drawing a whole bunch of cyberpunk stuff on his on his Instagram anyway. Nice. Uh, and so the the opportunity to actually do that with a story, I think, was very appealing to him as well. But we've still got that space opera in our back pocket if we ever need to. <laughs> Uh, do you have anyone else working with you on this particular team? Yeah, so um, I'm actually reunited with my Albert the Alien artist, uh, Gabo, uh, but he's going to be doing the colors on this series. So again, a unique challenge for him as well because he typically colors in a very Western style um, and everything that's on Webtoon very much looks like manga or anime. And so he has to kind of like change his style a little bit too when it comes to coloring to make sure that it aligns to the aesthetic that that appeals on the platform. Um, and so it's it's great to kind of be reunited with him again in a, in a different working capacity. And we've kind of given him carte blanche when it comes to the colors outside of the style requirements, right? Because that's kind of a Webtoon, um, Webtoon, Webtoon ask. Um, but we, we're just kind of like, dude, if you want to give him a yellow jacket, if you want to give him like funky neon lights, like if you want to, you know, make those ripped jeans purple instead of instead of blue jean like you have at it man have fun and so he's he's loving it because he's like i'm gonna add in like these glowing lights here and i'm gonna like he's just he's going at it with it and then um we also have uh, micah myers who's going to be doing the letters for our series as well and so micah you know is is an accomplished letterer within the space that's written for name a publisher right uh, he's worked for all of them in some capacity. And then he's also dabbed his toe in on the Webtoon platform before because he does the lettering for Justin Jordan's Urban Animal. Nice. So he's kind of the uh, the old pro when it comes to working on the Webtoons platform. And so he knows the appropriate font sizes to use. He knows how to, to format everything so that it's appropriate for the platform and that it'll fit on screen. Um, so he's been helping us out from that capacity um, as well. And I've worked with Mike on, on one or two projects before, and he's just been such a joy to work with. Um, and so the opportunity to work with him long term on this project is is really exciting, too. And then we have two editors from Webtoon that are helping us out uh, on the project as well. Uh, and so it's it's fun to kind of work with with them a bit. One of them is um, is newer to the team. So he just has, you know, nothing but enthusiasm uh, and energy when it comes to all things Webtoon and this story in particular. So it's been a real breath of fresh air. And we've started to get our notes in on the story. And 
you know, it's, he's, he's asking some really good challenging questions on there for some of the elements that we've got in there. Um, that again is, is forcing me to kind of have a little bit more introspection on the story or the characters, or, you know, is the scene as, as dramatic or as, you know, as, uh, as, as much tension as it could have, you know, how do we, really kind of pack it all in especially into those first few episodes that are so critical to kind of hook your readers how do we really maximize the impact that we can have within that space and so again uh, a bit of a veteran when it comes to uh the platform but again bringing that fresh energy uh into the story that that's always uh, encouraged and and something i appreciate introspection is always a good thing when it comes to being a creative person uh, as you are uh, looking a little more into yourself then in one sentence who are you oh man we just got esoteric uh, <laughs> uh, great question I mean I am a father a marketer and somebody who loves to tell a good story um, and honestly sometimes those things all overlap into a single package because sometimes you got to sell your kids on doing something they don't want to do. Sometimes you got to tell a, a, a story to them to make them go to sleep at night. Sometimes you got to figure out how to put storytelling into a deck about how your quarterly earnings are going, <laughs> you know? So it's, I think all of these things kind of intersect and work together in a way that's uh, not always apparent in the beginning, but um, yeah father marketer storyteller that's me what could you pay more attention to in your life oh goodness what couldn't i pay more attention to in my life uh you know the home tends to get neglected a little bit every now and then <laughs> i could mow the lawn a little bit more frequently um but my kids like the long grass so it's not so bad it's just the neighbors that give me dirty looks you gonna mow that thing today no yeah because it's gonna rain tomorrow and i mowed my lawn so it'd be nice if our two lawns looked look nice together there was a period of time where i moved into my house i'm not joking where um uh one of the neighbors next to me the neighbor behind me and the neighbor on the other side of me if one of us went outside to mow the lawn within five minutes the rest of us would all be outside mowing our lawns as well it became a competition and then i realized that one of my neighbors is actually retired and all he does is mow his lawn and i was like i can't keep up with that man. what lessons in your life did you learn the hard way Oh man, uh, so many lessons. Um, <laughs> uh, the one that I'll focus on, because honestly, it's it's very much related to Nexus um, fatherhood, right? Like, I I wanted kids for the longest time. I wanted to have kids when I was much too young uh, to be having them, and thankfully did not. Right? I was responsible about it. Um, but being a father has changed so much about my perception of the world the stories that I write and the kind of stories I want to consume um, and the kind of stories I want to tell. And, you know, nexus as a word, the definition is about bringing things together, right? It's a point at which people or places kind of come together. Something important happens there. Um, and that was really kind of why we liked the title of that for this story was because it's about these two disparate characters kind of coming together and they're very different worlds coming together. And my life is very much like that with my kids. I have two daughters. Um, I never grew up with, with sisters. My oldest daughter is the first girl born on my side of the family in three generations. Wow. Um, and so discovering the world through her eyes has been a really unique experience and something that I, I thought I knew what I was in for, um, but I I was not prepared. And there are still moments that'll come up where she'll say something or she'll mention something or she's made an observation about the world that I was pretty sure she wasn't gonna start talking like that until she was 12. And she's five, like, <laughs> you know, and I'm just, I'm like, I'm not ready. I'm not ready, stay young, stay young. And so she sits there and, and teases me all the time where she's like, you want me to stay a baby forever? I'm like, yes, yes, I do. <laughs> I understand this. I don't know where you're going next. Um, but she's a lot, you know, it's, it's a joy. It's a lot of fun. It's a lot of work. Um, and especially when trying to balance a day job and, uh, and a comic hobby. Um, 
but at the same time it is it is so rewarding i joke when i do like the panels when i talk about fatherhood and i'm like if you want people to not get pregnant sit there and just start saying like hey you want to watch that movie this weekend too bad you got a kid at home you want to go mow the lawn right now too bad your kid is screaming for sandwiches you want to watch that tv show that was on the other day before spoilers come out on the internet tough luck you your kid wants to watch my little pony like you know it's you really don't have control of your own life anymore and i think I'm going to paraphrase this Kevin Smith in his latest movie where he did the Jay and silent Bob reboot kind of touched on this the best where it's like, you kind of become the superhero within your own story. You perpetually exist within your own second act. And the purpose of your second act is to make the first act for your kid as spectacular as you possibly can. And to me, that was just such a a profound moment because that's what you're naturally doing as a, as a, as a parent anyway, you're trying to make, you know, your kids see the world and have morals and have, you know, ethics and have uh, the understanding of what's right and what's wrong. And, you know, why is it not okay to push your friend or <laughs> pinch your sister when she steals your graham cracker? Um, but, uh, but at the same time, like it, it's a lot of work, but it's all so worth it. And when they, they just, you know, snuggle with you on the couch and give you an unsolicited daddy, I love you. You know, your heart just melts. So what's my life like? What, uh, you know, again, who, who am I and, and how, how does all this package kind of come together and how is this influencing the stories I'm telling? It's that, it's that right there. I want to tell stories that my daughters can read with characters that they can look up to, um, and that they can idolize. Lots to digest there. (laughs) <laughs> Welcome to my life. <laughs> but it is fun, man, because, again, even even just looking at the platforms that they're going to be reading comics on. Oh, yeah. You know, we're adamant consumers of our library. They love books and they love comics, even at their library. We've read, like, the Tiny Titans books and some of the My Little Pony books, and they were big into trolls for a hot second. Um, and so what's the future of comics look like? that they are going to be reading, right? Like Webtoons. Webtoons is a growth platform. Like that readership only continues to grow and expand with the popularity of titles like Lower Olympus um, and Let's Play. Um, And while those stories are a little old for where my girls are right now, um, there's just a lot of positive messages and a lot of um, diversity in characters that they can look up to within those stories. And so... Again, I'm hoping that Nexus will be uh, a good addition to that kind of community of, of comics within the Webtoons uh, platform. Um, and something, again, that my girls will be able to, to pick up when they're old enough to do so and, and, and read on that platform. So, again, like that's, that's the other thing that I kind of try to think about when I'm looking at where my story should be. Is it something I should excuse me, self-publish? Is it something that I should pitch to a, to a publisher? And if so, comic book or literary? Um, and, and or should it exist on the web? And again, this just feels like a really good fit uh, and something that's going to continue to to grow and provide opportunities in, in areas where my daughters will be able to read someday. When are we self-improved enough to accept ourselves? Wow. All right. We're really getting a <laughs> existential in some of these well, questions. I got to switch it up with you because, you know, we, we talk so much in, about your career. Let's dive into the person. Sure. Well, uh, I don't think self-improvement ever stops, right? I think the day that you decide that you're good enough is the day that, you know, why, why live for tomorrow? Um, there's always something new to learn. There's always something new to experience. Um, you know, I had a really unique opportunity with my, my previous day job where I actually got to travel all over the world. Um, we had offices in Southeast Asia over in Singapore and we had regional offices down in in Mexico. Um, and I had the opportunity to go over to countries I've, you know, never thought I would visit. Uh, and I got to spend a lot of time there. And to me, like that experience alone, I was like, one, I want to do that again. (laughs) you know, either professionally or, 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 or for, you know, pleasure travel. 
Um, but there's also so much more of the world that I haven't had a chance to see yet that I would love to get out there and experience. And it's just travel, right? Like all the, you think about all the stories that you have yet to, to kind of consume, either read or watch or play. Um, you think about all the people that you have yet to meet and all of the unique experiences that they have out there and, and how that has helped, helped shape the perception of the world that they live in. Um, and then you think about all the things that my daughters are going to get to experience for the first time and the, the ways that I can kind of help craft those experiences to make them as as positive as, as possible. Um, there's so much out there to look forward to. And there's so much out there to do. I'm going to be that guy that's on my deathbed and be like, but I still have 28 things on my to-do list, man. And probably another 50 more after, after I get through those, I'm not, you know, I'm not ready. Um, and there are people out there that are, that are like that. Um, you know, Stan Lee was one of those people that just like constantly had stories in his head and constantly had experiences and kept giving those types of experiences to his fans. Um, and in the way that I can continue to try to influence people to tell their stories, to do the things that they love, to pursue their passions. Um, awesome. Those are also positive experiences that I pursue. Um, but when, when does that stop? I don't think it does, man. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think, I think that's ongoing. I think that's forever. Nice. What's your most recent literary pilgrimage that you've had? Oh, interesting. Uh, so I had set down um, narrative prose for quite some time. I had stopped reading novels. And it wasn't because I didn't like novels. It was just nothing really tickled my fancy. And, um, you know, nothing nothing kind of kept my attention. I would sit there and read, you know, a couple of chapters or something. I was like, nah, this doesn't hook me. And I would, I would toss it aside. And I recently got back into novels specifically with the expanse series, uh, which has a, you know, TV show on, on Amazon prime, obviously. Great um, TV but the, show on Amazon prime. Yeah. It's amazing. It's oh. an amazing show. Um, and the books are even better. Uh, and they read, like the show. I mean, it's just a very cinematic read and it's, it's a very interesting kind of narrative format that they have in there because every chapter is 10 pages. What? Every, everyone like boom, 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 10 pages every single time, yeah. um, fairly consistently. And so it's, it, it's a really interesting, uh, so I've, I've, I've kind of been reading that book to kind of dissect that book, if it makes sense, <laughs> yeah. to kind of understand, like, what do I like about this so much? What about it works for me? Is there anything in here that I can lift and shift into my own writing um, that I can or should do? And it was a really interesting, uh, we'll call it a step backwards, but that's not, that's, that's being disingenuous. It was a very interesting step backwards when I finished the latest Expanse book and then went back to Game of Thrones, right? It was the, the latest book in the Game of Thrones series because I hadn't, I hadn't read them. Um, and so I'm on the fifth book, the one that, that came out most recently, <laughs> about 12 years ago. Um, and the first chapter in that book is 22 pages. And it's just such a difference in pacing and storytelling approach in world building uh and the the people that worked on the expanse actually worked for george rr R. martin oh. on the game of thrones books so you can see similarities you can see things where they'll like lift and shift those elements from it um but his work is and uh, i i, I don't want to use this word to be negative, but his work is much more indulgent, right? Like there's just so much more that he wants to sh cram into a chapter. Mm -hmm. And so he allows his chapters to be longer, um, which for me, the style of reading that I like tends to be a little bit shorter and more snackable right. um, with like those 10 pages, like anything above like 12 to 15 pages. And I'm like, all right, I'm going to need a break here <laughs> <laughs> in a second. Um, and so I find myself like stopping consistently within the chapters of his book, but I'm also a really slow reader. Um, so that's, I think the latest pilgrimage that I've kind of made is, is one moving back into that narrative prose set. And then two moving from, uh, again, that more digestible kind of format back into a, a much thicker, more robust story. Um, and it's not a bad thing, but it's just, it's, it's such a night and day difference 
and and how the books are written. But it also fits for your style of comic creation as well too, especially with Nexus, especially with some of the uh, with the online content that is on like apps like Webtoon, etc. It's yeah, you know, we were talking about pacing uh, for Webtoons being quite different. It's really interesting because. You're writing for the printed page, right? When you've got 20 to 24 pages within a single issue. And I usually like format my graphic novels that way as chapters, just because it's it's easy for me to do. And you can kind of have like a major cliffhanger or like a major uh, dun 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 kind of moment there. Um, you can't do that. Sorry, sorry. So when you're writing those types of things, you have, you know, one, two, four page scenes. Right. So longer, meatier scenes tend to be maybe four pages um, on there. And, yeah, you can have some that last longer than that. But on average, like that's how I write. It's, it's like one page to two pages to four pages in terms of how long a scene is with Webtoon, because it's a panel count that they have, because it's all just, you know, a vertical scroll within a single episode. Those scenes tend to be longer. They tend to be like eight pages if you if if you if you think about how like I write an average of five to six panels per page, yeah. right? Um, the scenes within webtoons that I'm writing are about eight pages worth, <laughs> and I'm like, this is too long. I got to cut this down. Like, how, how do I self edit this? And you're and you're like, no, it's all necessary. It's all good stuff that's in there. I'm just not used to it. I'm not used to it being quite that meat. So there are things in there that I'll include that are subtle clues into like who characters are or what characters do outside of the scene that you normally don't have the space to do within the printed page. Uh, and that's really interesting and unique. I mean, Webtoon's like, look, you want to put, you know, 50 panels in an episode. You want to put 90 panels in an episode. You want to put 200 panels in an episode. You can do it. We're paying you the same amount per episode. So, <laughs> you know, maybe, maybe think about that. Um, but it's, you know, if you need to have a longer episode, you can um, versus like when you're doing the printed page now, man, you, it's 20 to 24 pages. That's it because it's got to fit within that page real estate. Yeah. It's amazing. I mean, technology has improved. The style of writing has, has shifted and improved from the various genres that become popular and others that fall off. Um, I'm glad you're still having fun with it. That's the main thing. I'm glad that you're still creating what you're creating because you know, if we didn't meet in Chicago in 2010, I don't think I'd know anything about you unless I passed you with showcasing Albert the Alien. I just think you're you're a treasure. You're you're a web you're a comic treasure. You know, keep oh. keep doing what you're doing. So, thank you. Appreciate that. <laughs> you keep doing what you're doing. That's why I keep coming back on. I love talking to you. <laughs> Plus, you know, we're never gonna do a five hour interview ever again. So that that is what it is. So. Never say never, my friends. <laughs> I don't know what you've got going on for the rest of your day, but I'm sitting next to a pizza and a thing of Chinese food, and I am ready to go. Uh, is there anything that I haven't asked you that you'd like to showcase to those that are watching and listening to this? Yeah, so for anyone who's interested uh, in print comics, uh, I do have an online store uh, that's doing a, a summer sale, a uh, summer reading program sale. This uh, It'll be July 20 through 27. And then we're also going to be participating in Indie, in Indie Comic Creator Day on July 31st. So the same sale will apply uh, July 20 through 27 and on the 31st. 50% off all my graphic novels, uh, which includes all the Albert the Alien books. And we're going to be putting up uh, the preview edition bundles that were convention exclusive. It's uh, six single issue previews of the new graphic novels that I'm working on, independent of the webtoon work that I'm doing, right? So we've got, you know, Witches of Eastwick Boulevard on there, which is an urban fantasy about two sisters that think they're superheroes, but it turns out they're the descendants of witches from the Salem Witch Trials. Uh, we've got, uh, you know, Los Ojos we're reprinting because we're going to do that as a series. It's a, you know, supernatural action story about a contract killer born with an ability when he looks people in the eyes, he doesn't see them as human, he sees them as angels or demons. So that was a convention exclusive that we printed for 2020 and obviously we were in pandemic so everything went into lockdown and i only had a chance to premiere it at, at one show i only have you know maybe a dozen of those left and so i'm going to put them back up for that week too um available um it's six comic books for 25 bucks 
uh, it's it's a pretty good deal. But the Albert the Alien books will be 50% off for that week only um, and, and, and on July 31st as well. So if you guys like comic books, if you like graphic novels, if you want to see the Albert the Alien graphic novel that, that Kurt's been talking about that got us nominated for two Harvey Awards, you know, buy two books for the price of one. <laughs> you know, get the whole series. It's only four books uh, for the price of two. So it's it's pretty cheap. And again, it's to encourage people reading this summer, uh, especially kids that are, um, you know, on summer break uh, so that they can get some good reading in. And if you guys are interested in Nexus, if you guys want to see more, because we're not going to we're not going to launch that series until next year, early next year, early 2020. Um, but if you want to get more info, sorry, 2022. Wow, I'm awake. Uh, thank you. <laughs> so we're going to launch Nexus in, in early 2022. If you want more information about it, though, we're going to be doing previews of it in my newsletter. It's a free monthly newsletter. Go to my website, trevoramuller.com slash newsletter. Um, and you can sign up for free on there. I won't spam you. It's, it's just a monthly uh, newsletter that comes out. But we just did the announcement on it in uh, this latest uh, update. The next update, we're probably going to end up doing an interview with my artist, Sebastian. Uh, and we're going to show some more character designs and, and some more previews. And we're just going to keep kind of having every monthly installment talk about Nexus at least a little bit, uh, of, along with my other projects. Uh, until the series launches sometime next year. So, uh, and then we'll obviously also announce the the official launch date uh, once we get the green light to do that. So uh, trevoramuller.com slash uh, newsletter uh, to sign up for free on there. Everyone has one or two people that inspired them on their path to where they are today. Who is that for you? Man, <clears throat> there's been a, a handful of people, right? But I would say my mother who encouraged me to pursue creative endeavors uh continued to sign me up for art classes and writing classes when i was young uh my babysitter who's the one who got me into comics um he had original black and white kevin eastman peter lord uh teenage mutant ninja turtle comics and i of course knew the animated series but I'd never read the comics and the comics were just so different and so unique. Um, and then I would say my buddy, Russell Lasau, who you mentioned earlier and our mutual friend, Josh Elder, who, when I was making the transition from being a person who just consumed comic content into somebody who created comic content professionally, I mean, they, they mentored me, they took me under their wing um, and they taught me and gave me opportunities that nobody else would would normally be able to afford to, to give me. Um, and both of them became close friends of mine. They stood up in my wedding uh, when I got married, uh, and we're still buddies uh, to this day. I would say are probably the ones that have influenced me the most outside of my kids, right? <laughs> right, like most most recently. So... From a professional standpoint, you've created many books. You're creating much more content uh, these days. You are a family man. You are also a talented writer and author and proponent of anything when it comes to comics. Do you consider yourself personally successful? You know, I've achieved a degree of success. Uh, I've accomplished goals that I've set for myself and I've done more in the amount of time that I've been creating content than I thought I would have. Um, so to that extent, yes. Uh, to the extent that I, you know, have been published by Marvel or DC or have a, a, a book out from image, um, or that I have, you know, a literary agent that, that helps get me graphic novels into bookstores. No, there's still tons of opportunity out there. Uh, and things that I want to keep doing. So I'm very proud of the success that I have achieved so far. And I'm very grateful and thankful to both the people who have mentored me to get there and the fans that have really allowed that success to happen. Um, at the same time, uh, there's more left to do. There's more I still want to do. Uh, and I'm going to continue to push for those new goals um, so that I can keep improving myself, my craft, uh, and telling the best possible stories 
that I can. The reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failures? You know, there are different ways that you can deal with them depending on the type of failure it is. I've had, you know, I've been pitching Webtoon for the past two, three years uh, on stories and Nexus is the first one that we got this far in the process. Every single pitch that was sent into them that did not get the green light was a learning experience. It was an opportunity for me to figure out what I need to do for the next pitch that I send into them. And it honestly helped to influence other pitches that I send over to, you know, print publishers as well. Um, because it's, you know, how do you want to see this story? What additional details do you need to understand what I'm trying to do with this series? Um, and so I always think of failure as, a, as an opportunity to learn. Um, it's not really a failure, it's a learning experience. Uh, and so even though we didn't get the green light on, on all of those pitches, on all of those stories, we learned enough to get Nexus green lit. <laughs> so we did something right there. Um, and then I still have these fantastic relationships with these artists that were attached to those projects. Um, and so there's always opportunity for us to either, you know, take that project and make it ourselves um, if we love it enough to do so and we have the time to do so. Uh, or um, to cultivate that relationship into another pitch that we might want to do down the road. So failure is kind of a disingenuous way to think about an opportunity to learn in my mind. Um, and it's it's just something that you should take for what it is, take and, and, and learn the things from it that you need in order to improve and use that to, to propel yourself forward and and keep the momentum going. Don't take any of the wind out of your sails. You have the younger generation with you currently, with your, your two daughters. You have many generations that have looked at your work and are becoming inspired to be creative themselves. How can they inspire the generation that follows them? It's, a, it's an excellent question. Um, you know, it's, it's telling personal stories that have meaning and that will resonate with the audiences that they that they cultivate. It's taking what they've learned, either from me or from their own experiences, and sharing those uh, with the next generation. And it's inspiring and encouraging them to continue to follow their dreams, no matter how out of reach they may seem um, or how implausible they may appear. Um, you know, I, I think about all the panel rooms that I've sat in over the conventions that I've attended over the years and how many people that I've challenged to go out and, and make their story, to tell their story. And over the over a decade that I've been doing this, I've maybe had half a dozen people come back to me and show me a comic book that they've made or a story that they've worked on. And then maybe two additional people who have gone out, one of them, you know, quit her job in Wisconsin and moved out to California and became one of the art designers on Hearthstone, the digital card game from Blizzard. Um, and another one, you know, went back to school and got her MBA. Uh, and I'm like, I'll consider those wins too. So it's, it's that inspirement that, that, that ins being able to inspire the next generation being able to educate the next edu uh, generation so they understand like, what do I need from a tools perspective, from an uh, experience perspective, from a, um, from a skills perspective. Um, and then being able to just continue to tell them to pursue those dreams, keep going after it, like don't stop, no matter what you do. Um, life's too short, life's too precious to not be doing what you love every minute of the day, right? And I've I've had a handful of friends that haven't been able to accomplish their goals because life was taken from them too quickly. Um, and I think of that as an inspiration to myself all the time of, you know, I don't know how many tomorrows I got ahead of me. So we gotta, we can't plan that I can do this thing months and years out. We've got to sit there and try to get this out now 
we've got to work on this thing now if I if I love it that much. And it's it's getting that kind of encouragement and inspiration out to to those those next creators, that next generation of creators and giving them the tools that they need. Again, not always something physical, right? Like sometimes it's just like the inspiration that they need um, to follow those dreams and to, to pursue their passions. So, so long as they can continue to share out that legacy, then I think I've done something right. Well, Trevor, I do hate to say this, but that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. Before I let you go, though, where can we find you on social media and uh, any websites you'd like to promote? Trevor A. Mueller is my website, trevoramueller.com. Trevor A. Mueller is also my Twitter, my Facebook, my Instagram, my YouTube. I think I have a Twitch. So find me, follow me, friend me. And uh, please join my newsletter, trevoramueller.com slash newsletter. Well, like I said, though, uh, that ends this particular episode of Two Weeks Talking. Of course, thank you, Trevor, as always, for coming on the show. A true pleasure is always to have you on. And and I want to have you back on more than five years apart. Please, please, let's make this a little more continuous. I, I hope so. we can we can make that happen. <laughs> Nexus launches next year, man. So I'll have lots to talk about after that goes live. That being said, though, you can take a look at this interview, his past interviews and thousands of other interviews on TwoGeeksTalking.com or TGTmedia.com. Subscribe and like and follow and friend me on our YouTube channel, which is youtube.com forward slash C forward slash TGT media. And of course, as I say every week, everyone has a story to tell and it's up to me to help bring that out. And I hope you everyone has a wonderful, great day and a great weekend. Hey, all Kurt Sasso here from Two Geeks Talking. If you like this video and these quick clips here, make sure you take a look at our YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash TGT media. Make sure you hit the like button and subscribe as well hit the bell to make sure you get notifications of course from videos like this here uh thank you everyone for listening and watching over the years and keep listening and watching for new and exciting interviews with talented creative people in the entertainment industry i'm your host kurt sasso thank you so much